for all ladies. You don't have to be a mother. You don't have to be a daughter. You just have to be a lady. And that eliminates half of you anyway. Oh, oh see, now, look, there you go. No, but that is, that is, <laughs> that, that is for you all. And there are, um, there's a sign-up sheet back there, so make sure that, we, that we've got you signed up if you're going to be there and the number of people that you're going to bring. And also, gentlemen, I wanted you to know that there is, there is a, a need for some guys to help, to help serve, to help clean, to help do those things. So if you would be willing, if you are a gentleman, which eliminates about half of you, I know, I'm getting on, I know, I, it's tacky this morning. I already got warmed up in Sunday school. I, after Sunday school was over this morning, I, I, I said, there wasn't very much discussion. And they were like, well, you're just warming up to preach. So obviously I got a little preachy this morning in Sunday school. But anyway, gentlemen, we could use your help. We're, we're going to help serve. And so if you would be willing to do that, we would very, very much so appreciate that. So, um, so know that there's a place on the board that if you would sign up to help, we would, we would appreciate that. There are other things here in the bulletin. Um, that I uh, that I trust that you will read and uh, that uh, you will you will see. So those are the announcements for today. Mandy, anything else about the mother daughter tea that I needed to announce? If you're going to sign up, sign up today because I'm going to try to get at the end of this to um, get the final count. Okay, sounds good. All right, let's worship the Lord.
Would you stand with me for the call to worship? Hear my cry, O God, listen to my prayer. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Let me dwell in your tent forever. Let me take refuge under the shelter of your wings. Will you pray with me? Our Father, as we come to you into your house today, we pray, Lord, that we will open our hearts and our minds, that we might be able to receive the words that you would give to us, the leadership that you would give to us, and the, the love that and joy that we can have to be in your house. Our prayer, Lord, is that you will come and be with us in all the things that we do in, in this service, that it will be glorifying to you. Lord, we pray that you will lead us and guide us and direct us in our thoughts, in our ways, and in the way in which we live out this following week. Lord, thank you for your son, and may we worship him today. I pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Please join me in our opening hymn, number 398, I Come to the Garden Alone.
before we pray, I'm going to give a little background on part of the prayer. We'll be praying for three teenagers in Laos. Their mother had died about 12 years ago when their father was raising them, and then February he died, and they became orphans. Their father's brother, their uncle, told blames God for his brother's death and told these three teenagers that I'll let you live with me if you renounce Christ. So it, they decided, no, we're not going to renounce Christ. So they're still following Christ. Right now they're living uh, in the house with their pastor's family. Uh, but we want to pray for these teenagers and for their uncle and his heart about God. So let us pray. Lord God, we thank you that here in the United States of America, we have freedom to worship. We thank you for those who have suffered and even died so that we could have that freedom today, that we can come here to church in this building and worship you freely, or even go out on Main Street on Sunday afternoon and put up a free prayer sign and, and not be concerned about any government authorities telling us, hey, you can't do that. Let us never, Lord, take that freedom for granted. We, uh, we thank you, Lord, for EPC. We pray that as we focus on your kingdom in this church, as we strive to make disciples in this church, that, we, that you would work and that you would grow the disciples. We pray even today as we meet for corporate worship that we can encounter you in a way that we couldn't encounter you any other way. We pray, Lord, as we meet in small groups, journey groups, that our fellowship with each other will be rich and we will experience you in our brothers and sisters and we can uh, indeed experience Christ in that way. We pray, Lord, throughout the week as we engage the world that you will open doors and give us opportunities to be a light for you in a dark world. And Lord, as we mentioned a while ago, we pray for these three teenage children that you, we, first we give you praise that they have resolve in their hearts for you, that they will uh, live sacrificially for you. And I pray, Lord, that and I thank you for their pastor who's taken them in. I pray that you will guide them to find more permanent uh, housing. But Lord, we pray for that uncle and for the aunt who are bitter against you. Lord, I pray that these kids' resolve will affect the hearts of the uncle and his wife, that they could realize that you are indeed the light of the world and they would come to faith in you and you could uh, build that relationship between him and his uh, nieces and nephew. Lord, we pray for Pastor David and Mary Ann this week as they have got away for a break, and a much needed break. I pray that you give them a wonderful time together, a time of uh, restoration, and uh, you know, just lift them up, Lord, that all could go well. I pray, Lord, for our congregation as we have various emotional needs, spiritual needs, physical needs that you minister to us. It, I, good to see Miss Barb with us this morning. And Lord, I pray, uh, pray this coming Saturday that the mother-daughter T would be a, a bright spot in the lives of many. Work in our midst, Lord. We need you. We need you. We come together as a body of believers and pray together the prayer you taught your disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debt as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This time in our service uh, where we collect an offering. And this is not just an offering just so that we can keep the lights on, but this is a time of worship. So um, my, my prayer is that as you uh, place your offering in that plate, that you would do it as unto the Lord. Also, uh, Miss Linda said that she's playing Alleluia uh, for the offertory. If you feel like singing along, please do. Heavenly Father, uh, we return thanks to you. We praise you because you are worthy. And Father, may this offering itself, the money given, the heart in which it was given, be praised to you. God, we thank you for blessing us. Use this offering to glorify your name. Use it to expand your kingdom. And we ask that in Christ's name. Amen. The epistle reading for today um, is found in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. A worker approved by God. Remind them of these things and charge them before God not to quarrel about words, which does no good, but only ruins the hearers. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. But avoid irreverent babble, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have swerved from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened. They are upsetting the faith of some, but God's firm foundation stands, bearing this seal. The Lord knows those who are his, and let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. Now in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honorable use and some for dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. 
have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels, and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. Please stand as you're able for our second hymn this morning, number 380, Living for Jesus, A Life That Is True. Dearest treasure, the light of 
find rest in Him. O Jesus, Lord and Savior, I give myself to Thee, for Thou in Thy atonement didst give Thyself for me. I own no other master, my heart shall be thy throne. My life I give henceforth to live, O Christ, for thee alone. I figured y'all needed a uh, song like that because y'all need to brush up on your old English, all of the these and thous and dits. So, anyway, gospel reading for today is from John chapter 20. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other's disciples told him, we have seen the Lord... But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger in the mark in, in the mark of the nails and place my hand in the side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your fingers here and see my hands. Put your hand and Put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord, my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe in Jesus, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. I've got to get organized up here. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are God. And we worship you and honor you and serve you as God. Today, God, as we open your word, may we, may we be not just hearers of your word, but doers of your word. May we look at it as a mirror and see where we fall short. May we see your heart. May we see your will. May we see who you are. And as you call us to yourself, may we be obedient. And we ask that in Christ's name. Amen. I hope you brought your Bibles with you today. And if you did, please turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. So open up your Bibles there because we're going to be walking through 2 Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 14. So I I have to admit to you all something, something that my family knows very well. Something about me that is probably one of three or four faults that I have in in all of the things that I am. I'm just kidding. There's there's, there's at least five. (laughs) Thanks, Doc. I have a horrible memory. I, 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 I have a horrible memory. I have always had a horrible memory. I... I say things I don't remember, I do things I don't remember, I go places and and I'm like, I kind of remember being there, but I don't remember anything about it. I, I, I I have a horrible memory. I mean, it's seriously bad. I mean, my kids are back there shaking their head. I mean, it is, it is seriously bad. It's, it's embarrassing at times. It's uncomfortable. I, I need, I need reminders. I was talking to Mandy about that, about this this week. 
And she said, well, it's just because you're so brilliant and smart and you've got so much going on in your head. That's a good wife, folks. <laughs> we should just pray and go now. But, but seriously, I, I do. I have, I, have a, I have a horribly bad memory. And one of the most important days of your life, your wedding, I don't remember what we had at our, at our wedding reception to eat. I don't, I, don't, I don't remember. I don't remember dancing very much. I remember dancing some. I, I, I guess we weren't supposed to. I was Baptist then. And, um, but but I, I just, I, I, I'm being serious. I, had, I, have this, I, have this, I have a horrible memory. And, 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 and in that, I need reminders. And, and in fact, if, if um, a lot of guys, I get lots of phone calls at work and I'll be driving down the road, I'll be in the middle of other things, and my standard answer to them when they need something, when they want something, is send me an email so that when I, when I go through it, there's a better chance that I, that I do what you need. Because I just have a, I have a horrible memory. And, and, and I know I'm not the only one. We all need reminders. <laughs> we all need reminders. And so in 2 Timothy here, Paul is writing... Timothy, the, the second letter, at, at least the second letter. And, and this is later on in Paul's ministry. In fact, Paul is, is awaiting execution at this point. He's been condemned. He's awaiting execution. He's writing this letter to encourage Timothy to hold fast to Christ. I mean, here is Timothy's mentor in prison, and he's about to die for his faith. And here's Timothy, this young pastor. He's having trouble in his church. And Paul is writing him this letter, encouraging him, hold on to Christ. And in this, he is calling Timothy to, to endure the things that are going on. Not to lose hope in the fact that, that Paul, his mentor, is, is, is facing this execution. He, he's, he's calling him to be to be faithful and, and, to, and to have faithfulness in the face of these false teachers. He, he's encouraging him in the power of Scripture. And in chapter 2, as we read it, starting in verse 14, he reminds Timothy to remind his people that the church body is not to be quarrelsome. Look with me, if you will, Chapter 2, 2 Timothy, verse 14. Remind them of these things and charge them before God not to quarrel about words, which does no good but only ruins the hearers. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Paul begins this section of his letter and he kind of bookends it with what we would call the end of chapter 2 with, with two kind of reminders and two kind of charges for Timothy. To remind his people to not be quarrelsome and to be servants of God. He's going to bookend those at the end of what we're going to read today and look at. And the, the whole big point is here is that remind them not to be quarrelsome and remind them to just serve God. He tells them not to quarrel over words, what someone says. Not, not, to, not to fight and dispute and argue. And he's really going to tell us what was going on here with these false teachers. And these false teachers, look, we all have different opinions on things. We, we do. I have different opinions than you do on some things. Trust me, you have all the right in the world to be wrong. But he says, as, as, a, as a church family, remind them not to, be, not, to, not to quarrel and not to look to fight and not to look to argue over this. But be workers. He's going to call them to do that at the beginning. He's going to remind them to do that at the end. He says, present yourself as a worker who, who rightly handles truth. 
Now, a lot of times we look at this little verse here and we're just like, well, this is for preachers and how they handle the scriptures. But remember, he says, remind the whole church not to be quarrelsome, just to do your job, to work, to be a servant of God. And he said to handle truth. So that means if somebody comes up and says, says Mark is a no good, rotten, text it, thank you. That's, but see, part of that's true, you know what I mean? To rightly handle the truth and say, no, in some parts of the world, he's kind of a big deal. See, handling the truth here is not just understanding how to, how to, how to, how to read Scripture and apply Scripture, but it's really about the truth of, of what may be going on in that situation. But even the facts of a situation, he, the, the word here that it handles the truth or rightly divide is to cut straight. My wife is a is a quilt maker. Didn't know if y'all knew this or not. She's, she's, she's made a couple of quilts, and, and she's, made, she's making one right now for a friend of ours that's getting married. Well, it's her friends. They're not my friends. And, and, she's, and, and this is, I don't know, the third or fourth or fifth. I don't know. It's, it's, it's one, and, and she, she, she does this, and, and this one fit on the backing better than ever. And she said, you know what? I got my cuts down right. She said, I, I finally got my cuts down right where it all fits and it's all square. And, and, and when we're talking about facts and truth here, you and I, we need to know what the facts are. We need to stand on the facts and the truth. We need to make sure that we cut those facts straight and we don't get off square with the facts. Starting with the Word of God and, and moving to the facts that may be just situational, right? Right? The thread here is don't be looking for a fight. Do your job. See, at our house, we have a term. And I don't know about you, but I don't know what it is about my kids, but they use fighting words. You know what, I, you know what fighting words are? Huh, somebody doing the dishes and whew, well, you really messed that up. It's none of your business. She's doing her job. Don't, don't use those fighting words. Those are fighting words. Huh. Well, you look awful today. Those are fighting words, right? Don't, we got to be careful that we're not looking to use fighting words. It reminds them not to argue, but to be an approved workman. He also says in verse 16, look at 16 through 19 with me, if you will. He says, he says, but avoid irreverent babble, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Ooh, Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetius, who have swerved from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened. They are upsetting the faith of some, but... God's firm foundation stands, bearing this seal. The Lord knows who are his, and let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. He says, avoid irreverent babble. <laughs> I just think that's a funny word. He says, a purposely swerve around stupid words. Don't get caught up and somebody else's, and I'm going to, and I'm going to just say this, because I think it points a good picture, don't get caught up in somebody else's verbal diarrhea. He talks about this being, being causing gangrene. He uses a pretty disgusting illustration here, because he's making a good point. I don't know what it is that my house and I'll tell you, I'm as guilty as all, I don't, how many kids do we have? 14, 15, somewhere in that neighborhood. <laughs> I'm as guilty as all. Somebody says something wrong at my house, buddy, I'm ready to pounce on them. And, they give, and, and most of the time, it's just silly, stupid things. I know nobody else here is like that. He says, avoid it, just swerve around it. He said, because when you entertain that, it 
just causes corruption and corrosion and just rottenness. It will only cause infection for all those who, in, who listen to it and entertain it and go along with it. I mean, he, he uses the term gangrene here. Gan Green, when Paul's writing this, he's talking about, he's talking about a time when things would rot off. <laughs> We're, this is pre-antibiotics. We ain't got no triple biotic an ointment to rub on it and put some bandages on it. He's talking about something that is just so rotten and putrefied you can smell it. Doc, I, I remember working in an auction barn growing up, and, and, and I remember cancer-eyed cows coming in. And you could smell them on the trailer. Just a cow that had an infection that was gangrenous and just eating, eating her eye out. And you could smell her. He says to avoid that, to avoid this babble, avoid this irreverent, stupid talk. He said because it's just going to rot everything. It's gruesome. And he even gives evidence of, Paul, Paul gives Timothy evidence of these two men... Who have, who have said that the resurrection has already come. And they're not talking about the resurrection of Jesus. They're talking, about the resur they're talking about the second coming of Christ. He said, and it's disrupting people in the church. See, the, the fruit, the fruit of, of irreverent babble, the fruit of stupid talk is destruction and rottenness. He says, the solution is, God knows what's going on, and you depart from iniquity. You do you. You do you. See, as, he's, as he has weaved this narrative together for Timothy, he has told him, don't get caught up in the quarrels that are going on, the irreverent babble. He said, he said, just put your head down and do what you know to do. I, I, I say this. I say this because families are destroyed. Families are destroyed when we pick and pick at each other. There are some days I look at Mandy and I say, Honey, I don't know what you did wrong. I wasn't around enough to raise these kids. Obviously, it's your fault. <laughs> but there are days that we just have to sit everybody down and just say, Stop. There, there are times that, that, in, that, that in the past when I've done marriage and counseling with people, and I said, you've just got to stop picking. Nobody is perfect. One of the, one of the approaches that, that, I, that, I, that I believe is, is absolutely truth in any kind of counseling, whether it be, whether it be uh, parents and children, whether it, be, whether it be siblings, whether it be husbands and wives, wh where, wherever it be is, is look, you got faults, I got faults, they got faults. You work on you. I, I can't even change myself, much less can I change this lovely woman, Mandy Kirk. Look, she's got faults. I know that y'all don't know that, but look, the biggest one happened about 22 years ago. She makes bad decisions at times. And he says, you depart from iniquity. It's really interesting here as he, as he even names these two guys. He doesn't say, go out there and you whip them up and you tell them the truth and you hold them down and you waterboard them till they agree with you. See, that's what I want to do at my house. In fact, he goes on to say, Work to be holy. Look at verse. Look at verse twenty. 
Now in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honorable use, some for dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. Work to be holy and useful ready for good works that he's called you to. You know, it's it's easy to get caught up in the negative and the destructive words of others. It's easy. It's easy to get get caught up in, I mean, mean, how, how silly are these guys here that Paul is talking about that says, they said the resurrection has already come. Well, that's just the stupidest thing ever. Jesus hadn't come back yet. That's the stupidest thing ever. Jesus hasn't come back yet. Obviously, y'all don't agree with that statement. (laughs) How how silly is that to go around saying that? And he says, don't get caught up in their silly words. Do your job. Be a servant. Ready for every good work. So how do we do that? How do we do that? He says, be the Lord, verses 22 through 26, be the Lord's servant, not a slave to the emotions. He says, first of all, to flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call upon the name of the Lord from a pure heart. Have nothing to do with ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome. Be kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. He says, flee from youthful passions. Flee from the emotions that we all get caught up in in these times of arguments and falsehoods and false narratives he says, he says flee, flee, from, flee from your emotions of that, your youthful passions, and pursue righteousness and faith and love. He says, have nothing to do with the ignorant controversies. And he calls him the Lord's servant. There again, we, we get this picture of, 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 of being the servant of God and, and, and serving him and being that workman. The Lord's servant must not be one who instigates or propagates quarrels. In fact, he tells them, he goes on, he says, be kind to everyone. I would like to tell you that the Greek word there doesn't mean everyone. (laughs) But the Greek word there for everyone means everyone. But being kind to, to, to those who, who being kind to those who breed quarrels, those who those who instigate quarrels, those who propagate quarrels, being kind to them does not mean that we just let silly people get away with silly things. In fact, what does he say? Be kind to everyone. Yes, everyone be kind to them. Be able to teach and have patient endurance. Correcting them with gentleness. You know what my biggest problem in that whole statement is? Correcting with gentleness. I am not always a gentle person. Not being quarrelsome does not mean that we just ignore that person who is spewing irreverent babble and that we just that we that we just that we just shun them or 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 that we that we just just he says we are we are to teach with endurance. Look, I like quick solutions. You know the problem with really quick solutions is they generally don't work. <laughs> Complex problems have complex solutions. 
Complex problems have complex solutions. And what Paul is telling Timothy here, as he's telling him, remind the people that are under you, know how to handle the truth, know how to handle the facts. Don't let somebody get away with irreverent babble and silly talk. Teach them with patience and endurance. Correct them in gentleness. Why? Well, it tells them because it's better to win a brother or sister than win an argument. It's better to win a brother or sister than to win an argument. Verse 25, correcting his opponents with gentleness... God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of truth and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. I need reminders. Somebody was telling, we were talking about Forrest Gump earlier today, I kind of sometimes feel like Forrest Gump, I'm not a smart man. I need reminders. Folks, we, we, need a, we need a reminder. I need a reminder in my family, with, with, my, with, my, with my brothers and sisters, with my wife, with my children, with my church family, with people that I come to, uh, come in contact with, with work, in work, some of those people who are my friends. I need a reminder. I need a reminder that I don't have to win the argument. I want to win the brother or sister to Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it is you and you alone who saves. It is you and you alone who calls us to be your servant. God, you, you, you are the one that we serve. You are the one that deserves the reward of the suffering. God, I pray that we would be patient and gentle with those around us. God, that we would not look for quarrels and fights, but God, that we would look to be a workman approved. God, I pray that we would be gentle with those who need correcting. And we ask that in Christ's name. Amen. come to the time where we will observe and participate in the Lord's Supper. Let us start with an agreement on the Apostles' Creed. Stand with me, if you will, as we confess together, I believe in God the Father, mighty maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. We come to the table today not because we are worthy, not because we deserve it, but because Christ has invited us. And he's invited us to come and to meet with him. And he's invited us to confess our sins that we may be forgiven. And so this time, we'll have a prayer of confession, silent prayer of confession, and then I will um, end that with a prayer myself. So let's pray.
God of gods, we come and we do confess that we are sinners, that we have fallen short of your standard, of your glory. But yet, God, you have given us your son, Jesus, to stand in our place, to hang on a cross in our place, to suffer for those sins. And God, we come and meet with him today. God, we thank you that you, that you tell us that if we will confess our sins, that you will forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And God, we, we claim that promise because your son has given himself for us. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. We come today because we are not worthy. And we don't have any righteousness that is our own. For we have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We come not because there is magic in partaking of these symbols of Christ's body and blood. We come not from a sense of duty or, or, or some kind of ceremony, but we come in appreciation for this blessed means of grace, this highest privilege of Christian worship. We come because Christ invites us to come. And this is his table for those who have put their faith and their trust in him. This is his table that he invites those who have been saved. We come because it is a vivid portrayal of the redeeming sacrifice of Jesus Christ on Calvary. We come because it shows us his matchless life, his victory and suffering, his faithfulness even unto death. And in that, we are brought here to worship him at his table. We come in contemplation because as we meet with him, we meet with the Father. And we are moved for such a great salvation. We come to encounter Jesus Christ. We come for forgiveness. Many times in my past, I always saw this table as just a memorial time to remember, but it's not just a memorial. It's not just a time to remember. It's a time because I I have sinned, and it's a time to meet with Christ and receive that forgiveness. This is a time for us to repent and turn back to him as we meet with him at this table. I come because I can arise from the Lord's table with new strength, new courage, and new power to live for him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it is your grace that we receive in this time. It is your presence that we receive in this time like no other time. God, we worship you through this. May you be honored and glorified. And we ask that in Christ's name. Amen. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread with his disciples. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take and eat, this is my body, which is broken for you.
us pray. God, we thank you for the broken body of Jesus. That his body was broken for us. We ask that in Christ's name. Amen. In the same manner, he also took the cup. And when he had eaten with them, saying, This is the cup of the New Testament, the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, according to your commands and your purpose, that all things are cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. We thank you for the blood that Christ shed for us. In his name we pray. Amen. Please stand with us, if you will. After the disciples uh, finished what would become instituted as the Lord's Supper, it says that they went out singing a hymn. Please join us as we sing our closing hymn this morning, number 417, What a Fellowship, What a Joy Divine. What a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms, leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting Pilgrim. 
pilgrim way Leaning on the everlasting arms Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day Leaning on the everlasting arms Leaning, leaning Safe and secure from all alarms Leaning, leaning Leaning on the everlasting arms What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms I have blessed peace with my Lord so near on the everlasting arms Leaning, leaning Safe and secure from all alarms Leaning, leaning Leaning on the everlasting arms to get my Bible for the benediction. Because like I said earlier, I'm not a smart man. <laughs> I, I do, I do. Receive this benediction. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen.